morning, everyone. My name is Elliot Katz, and I am the global co-chair of DLA Piper's Connected and Self-Driving Car Practice. I hope my mic isn't too loud. Um, and I focus on regulatory, privacy, and policy issues surrounding self-driving cars. I work with automakers, tech companies, and municipalities. And Karen, who's about to introduce herself, and I are here talking about the future of smart cities. Thanks, Elliot. I'm Karen. I'm from the Prime Minister's office in Singapore. I'm the Smart Nation Director covering North America. I live here in the Bay Area now. I do partnerships, comms and marketing, as well as research for the Smart Nation office. Just a piece of trivia about Singapore, we call ourselves a smart nation, not smart cities, because Singapore is basically a city in a nation. So if you have to fill up an address, you know, you have to fill in your city, and then your state, and then your country, like Stanford, California, United States. In Singapore, I have to put Singapore, Singapore, Singapore. So that's why we are a smart nation, right? So it's really nice to be with you guys today. So let's jump right into it uh, with a few questions to get us started. First off, a couple questions for you, Karen. Mm -hmm. What is the goal of a smart city? How do you measure success? And what steps specifically is Singapore taking to become a smart nation? Right, so, you know, the term smart cities is used pretty loosely, many, many definitions out there, and I, so I like that question about what the goal of a smart city is because the goal determines what you do and your entire approach to it. In Singapore, we're very clear that the goal of a smart city is threefold. It's all about the citizen, right? Improving the city experience, providing economic opportunities for citizens, as well as um, strengthening community engagement. So that really affects how we deploy the technology. We want to deploy it in a way that improves the lives of everyone, not just those who can afford the technology. Let me give you an example about how we, um, what are our goals and how do we deal with smart transportation. So we start with a problem. The problem with transportation today is that you know, Singapore is smaller than the size of New York City. We have 5.4 million people and it's only growing and we can't grow our land size, right? How do you move people in an efficient way? And it has to get more and more efficient as your population grows. And we have one big problem, which is like everyone wants to own a car in Singapore. Why? 98% humidity, public transportation takes twice the amount of time as, as you know, the journey in a private car. So that is our problem. People want to own cars. Cars are super inefficient in terms of land use, and we have not enough land. 12% right? of our land is spent on roads and only 14% on housing right now. So that's the problem, and what we want to do is to make shared mobility so attractive that even people who can afford a car don't want to own a car. Our goal, our moonshot target is 100% shared mobility, right? And once you have that goal, then you can start working on the technology that addresses this. It doesn't have to be super fancy. The first thing we did was to just collect data and share it more. We put sensors in every public bus so that we know exactly where they are, what time they arrive at the bus stop, how crowded they are, and we make that available to people so they can plan their trips better. You know, um, as, as the planners, we also know when we can inject new buses into the lines, and ride-sharing companies like Uber can integrate it with our apps. So that's how we start, and autonomy is a huge part of that. We'll talk about that later. But you know, as a smart city, we always think of what's the problem we want to solve for the people and the government, uh, then set a really ambitious target for us, 100% shared mobility, and then deploy technology. It's always about in that order, not technology first. Same for healthcare, same for housing. But before I go into autonomy, I want to ask my friend Elliot, who is the global co-chair of DLA Piper's Connected and Self-Driving Car Practice, you know, what is the state of self-driving car technology today? Why is it such a hot topic right now? Sure, thanks Karen. So. First, I think it's important to talk about what exactly is a self-driving car. We, we've heard a lot, especially over the last year, from numerous companies saying, we're going to have self-driving cars on the road by 2020 or 2021 or 2022. But what exactly does that mean? And to me, I work on this stuff pretty much every day. Just saying you have a self-driving car basically means nothing. Um, what these companies really mean, or what they should mean, 
is um, when they say self-driving is what the Department of Transportation calls highly autonomous, autonomous vehicles. And so those would be SAE level three, level four, and level five. But let me break down what each of those terms mean so that everyone understands here. So level three is an autonomous vehicle that can do the driving, uh, you know, some of the time. But some of the time, the human has to take over the driving task. And I would say that level three has a fair amount of issues because humans are not necessarily very good at taking over the driving task. NHTSA, which is the regulator in this space, has done testing and it's shown that it can take upwards of 17 seconds for a human to take over when the car uh, can no longer drive. So that's obviously very problematic. It becomes more problematic if someone is asleep or intoxicated in the back seat. Level four, is a car that can take over the entire driving task, um, but it can only do so in what the government calls certain operational design domains, which is really just a fancy way of saying in certain environments. So a level four vehicle can take over the entire driving task if it can only go a certain speed or if it's in a certain geofenced area or if it's in a certain designated lane on the freeway or certain weather conditions, et cetera. Now, level five is, this is, in my opinion, where all the magic happens. This is where you just get in the car, you tell it by voice command where you wanna go, and you go to sleep in the back seat, and you wake up and you've arrived at your destination. So now, back to the original questions. What are these companies really saying when they say they're going to have a self-driving car on the road in, say, 2021? Probably they're talking about a level four, most of them are talking about a level four vehicle that can take over the entire driving task, but it can only do so in certain very well-defined environments. Level five is and this is an interesting way to say this, but I would say this is true. I would say that the technology is about 99% there, but that one last 1% teaching a car to you know, react to all the stupid things that humans do while they're driving in a car, that last 1% is a very hard piece of the puzzle to crack. So I think we're still pretty far out from true level five autonomy. Now, Karen's other question, why are these cars such a hot topic right now? Why is this a big deal? And I think there's a myriad of reasons why they're a big deal, but I think the biggest deal is that, quite frankly, humans, Karen and I, all of you, um, the harsh reality is we're not very good at driving. And there's a clear technological fix in an autonomous vehicle. And, and the numbers are pretty um, stunning. So 1.2 million people die each year, and in the U.S., due to road accidents, in the U.S., 94% of those accidents are caused uh, by human error. Now, to use an analogy, that's the equivalent of seven fully loaded 747 airplanes crashing every single day in a given year and killing everyone inside. And so, for whatever reason, our society has said, this is acceptable. Um, we're going to accept the fact that, you know, we need driving to get around, so we're accepting this level of loss. But the reality is, if that happened in the U.S. for even one week, right, you have seven airplanes going down every single day and killing everyone inside, we would shut down the aviation space as we know it. Um, to look at it from a slightly even more terrifying angle, 3,000 people died yesterday due to road accidents. 3,000 people will die today, tomorrow, etc. cetera. Um, NHTSA has said that autonomous vehicles can prevent 19 out of 20 of these accidents from taking place, thus saving over 1.1, potentially saving over 1.1 million lives. So I think that's why it's such a hot topic right now. You have a clear technological fix to a, of what is it now an actual very, very big problem, and, and a lot of people want to see that getting solved. 
So, Karen, can you tell us how AVs, autonomous vehicles, are a part of Singapore's smart city plans in, in moving forward? Right, absolutely. Autonomous vehicles are a huge part of Singapore's plans, and you know, most smart cities are thinking about them. In Singapore, we have trials going on for the past few years, but if we take a step back, you know, besides safety, how does autonomous vehicles add to this vision of 100% shared mobility, right? I would say that it's a natural progression. The first thing you do is have connected vehicles, like you know, Uber, putting sensors in your buses allows you to optimize that whole fleet, right? Enabling more real-time transport, more information. And then you have shared mobility, which brings the cost of these rides down. So more people go into shared, into, you know, don't, don't need to own the car. And then finally, you have autonomy, which really just heightens the impact of that, driving people towards shared mobility. For example, if you have an autonomous fleet, you can dynamically size it much more efficiently than a human-driven fleet, right? Whenever there's a surge in demand, you can pump in some additional cars. You know, when you're autonomous vehicles, they can move from one place, drop one person off, go to the next person. It's perfectly optimized. You never see them stopping in the city center where there's just limited roads and parking space. And that frees up a lot of parking space downtown for, for commercial activities which benefit everyone, for example. So yeah, autonomous vehicles play a huge role in, in, in our goal towards 100% shared mobility. I would add one more thing. We typically think of the autonomous car, but there's also autonomous utility vehicles and autonomous freight. What happens now is that these vehicles are moving in the day, cutting, you know, cutting the leaves of trees, moving heavy, vehicle, heavy um, freight back and forth on the country, jamming up the roads during peak hour. Right? We want them to do it at night, but it doesn't make sense for companies to pay their workers more to work overnight. But if you have autonomous vehicles, all these activities can be done at night. It frees up the roads in the day and makes traffic con conditions easier for commuters, right? So they really add to the vision of 100% shared mobility. So again, yes, autonomous vehicles are a huge part of smart cities, but when we think about them, we have to think about the objective, right? Moving people into shared mobility, and then that really affects how we introduce them. We want to introduce them in fleets, you know, not just individual autonomous vehicles. And we also invest in things which may not seem like the hot topic right now, like autonomous utility, autonomous freight, because that, those are incredible, incredibly important parts of achieving our goal, right? So that's how we see the autonomous vehicles as a smart city. I want to ask, I want to put it back to Elliot now. You know, we talk about the incredible safety benefits of autonomous vehicles. Tell me, why are they not going to be on our road sooner? So I think there's a couple of barriers right now. I think, uh, you know, the first one is we need the driving public to buy in to this concept, right? Um, and I think the other main barrier is really the government is usually pretty far behind in terms of regulating new technologies. There's been some very big strides uh, made this year, especially at the federal level. Um, but we, we do need the regulations in place. I think some people would argue that this is a very new technology. We don't know where this is going. We don't want heavy-handed regulation that would potentially uh, stifle innovation, which I agree with. Uh, but I also do think that regulations are necessary. Um, perhaps not for the reason that a lot of other people think they're necessary. I don't necessarily think that they're needed to incentivize automakers to do the right thing or put the safest product on the roads. This is one of the most highly regulated industries in the world. 99% of automakers' day is thinking about safety. Um, and there's other incentives to do that. If, if they were to put a vehicle on the road, say a fully self-driving vehicle on the road, and a creative plaintiff's attorney could make an argument that there is a reasonable alternative design, you know, a, a car that has no um, autonomous features and that's a safer product, that would be a class action that would cost them billions of dollars. It just wouldn't be worth it. But I think that the regulations need to be in place because it gives the driving public some sense of, okay, this is regulated, the government has bought into this idea, perhaps I should do. It's a sense of a level of uh, comfort. So, Karen, I wanted to ask you, what are some challenges for smart cities? 
I can talk about a few, but I think I'll focus first on the issue of trust, building on what you said about safety. If you really, you know, our goal is for everybody to benefit from these new technologies, everybody to benefit from autonomous vehicles. So what Elliot says is incredibly important. They need to want to ride the autonomous vehicle in the first place. And, you know, many of you may be early adopters, but maybe that's 20% you know, of people. So how do you introduce them in a way that makes everyone want to ride them? It's a, it's a big deal. In Singapore, we want to we introduce them in limited context first, in trial areas, we raise a lot of interest in it. If any accidents happen, it's the damage is very limited, right? No one dies, for example. Uh, because that can make it take a few steps back in terms of getting general public to trust the technology. So we want to do it in trial areas and start branching out from there to get everyone on board. Everyone wants to ride a autonomous vehicle. Uh, but trust also extends to privacy issues. And we haven't talked about the full suite of smart city technologies. One of them is you know, IoT, putting sensors in your lampposts, in your traffic lights, sensors that can detect what's happening in the city, traffic conditions, flooding conditions. Uh, but they can also be used for surveillance, right? And people need to be convinced that they are not being used for that. There's technological issues to do with that. For example, anonymization and aggregation as well as homomorphic encryption, where you can do com computation on the data without seeing it. Um, but there's also legislation you need to put in place. In Singapore, we put in place the Personal Data Protection Act a few years ago in anticipation of this. It's a consent-based framework. Uh, you, know, you need to consent for your personal data being collected and used. So that's really, really important. And as a government, you need to have a, or whoever builds the infrastructure, really, you need to have a conversation with people on, uh, on the rules, you know, in Singapore, we're quite lucky. People trust the government quite a lot. Um, we, we did a survey, and people are very happy for this sensor network to be rolled out. We're rolling out a sensor network of 100 million smart objects, which can help monitor what's happening in the city. Right? They're happy for it to be rolled out in exchange for good services. But we cannot take that for granted. You know, anything can happen. But I want to also let Elliot talk a little bit on this, because the cultural context is very important. In the US, I understand it's very different. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with Karen more that, that a huge part of implementing a smart city is about engaging that community. It's about uh, trust in the government. Unfortunately, here in the US, we're not as trusting as our government, especially post-Snowden, as perhaps some Singaporeans are. Um, so that's an issue. We're, we're starting from a different... Um, point mm -hmm. than uh, Singapore is. But I think it's it, it, two things to keep in mind. Governments, at least municipalities that I've worked with, they are in no way, shape, or form trying to do this to spy on their constituents, right? There is real benefits that these cities have to offer. And I think the more that citizens understand and have a real understanding of the benefit that will come to them if these um, smart city products and systems are put into place, that that's when you'll get real buy-in. Um, but it is important to engage uh, the folks in whatever community you're working with because this is very different than buying a product, right? Or buying a self-driving vehicle. If, if you, you, know, you go to X, car companies self-driving vehicle and you look at their terms of service and their privacy policy and you say, I don't like that privacy policy, so I'm going to buy from this brand instead. When you're talking about a city, especially yeah. somewhere where people have lived for 10, 20, 30 years and are not going to want to move because they disagree with the way smart city is implemented, um, it's a very, very different scenario. Yeah. So I think it's very important when cities are rolling this out to show how this benefits um, the citizens and really get buy-in on the front end.